radio's own show, Behind the Mic. Radio, with a switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. But there are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And now, that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy, and information that are behind the mic. And now presenting a man whose name since the beginning of broadcasting has been a byword in radio, Graham McNamee. Thank you, Jill Martin, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. We've had some people on this program who make their living out of radio in unusual ways, but I think our next guest tops them all. His name is Milton Herman, and he makes his living by dying. Milton, will you tell us about it? Why, yes, Graham. I guess you can say I make my living by dying. I specialize in playing the parts of heavies. That's to say, villains on programs. Mm -hmm. Rats who almost invariably get theirs in the end, and the listeners are glad of it. For two years, I played killers in true detective mysteries. I had the dubious distinction of playing the parts of Two Gun Crowley, Babyface Nelson, and other thugs in Gangbusters. I was lefty in the well-known sketch skyscraper, which was repeated five times on the air. Tough guy. Oh, I wasn't a gangster in that, Graham, but I fell off the top of a building and died that way. For the past ten years, I've played sourdoughs in Death Valley days, and for five years, I was with Warden Lord. Is that so? What were you in for? Just the program, Graham. Oh. My uh, characterizations are derived from observation and not experience. <laughs> well, Milton, do you mind giving us a few examples of your peculiar art? Well, I'd be glad to, Graham. Here's one way I frequently have to die. In this, a squealer is facing one of his mobs. I tell you, Dutch, I couldn't help it. The cops gave me the third degree. I didn't want to die. They made me. Oh, no. No, I didn't want to talk, I tell you. Dutch, Dutch, you're not going. Give me a chance. Put up that gun. Dutch, don't. Don't. Give me a break now. Oh. That body you heard falling wasn't Milton. His life insurance agent just fainted. Uh, is there a different technique, Milton, uh, when you're bumped off by a knife? Yeah. Uh, it's us a longer drawn out. Mm. You can feel the knife. <laughs> a nice guy to have at a party. Now, would you like to hear death by strangulation? I sure would, if you're sure it'll work. Well, in this one, I'm a night watchman in a silk warehouse making my rounds. Well, everything seems to be all right in there, I guess. Oh, I don't know how the audience feels, but I got chills playing tag up and down my spine. In programs like Death Valley Days, I sometimes have to die of thirst. See, I'm a prospector, and I'm trying to make the next water hole under the burning sun of the desert. Water. Water. Gotta get to the water hole. Ah! You vultures, you aren't going to get me. Ah! You're never going to get me. Ah! Water, water, gotta ah! get to the water hole. What a grand spot this would be for a soft drink sponsor. I'd just step in with... Folks, you don't have to die for lack of a drop of water. No, sir. Go to your nearest grocer and buy six bottles of American wet ginger ale or something. Well, uh, how about one last thrilling example, Milton? Well, Graham, how about this? I'm a riveter on a scaffolding way up on top of a building when suddenly... Oh! Help! Help! I'm falling! I'm falling to my death! Oh, help! Help! <laughs> Where am I? Oh, oh boy, oh boy, a dream. I was dreaming. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like more like the DTs to me. But anyway, thank you very much, Milton Herman. Thank you. <laughs> TV 
60s in radio, presenting odd little true behind the mic stories that help make radio sometimes amusing, sometimes exasperating, but always interesting to the people in it. This week, as a salute to radio's 20th anniversary, we present a whole series of oddities about the early days of radio, as told by a man who has New York's oldest daily newspaper column on radio. It dates from 1924. The radio editor of the New York Daily News, Ben Gross. Hi, Ben. Hello, Sam. Now, Ben, suppose you tell us about some of the odd happenings of the early days of radio. Well, Graham, one of the strangest incidents that I can remember concerns a man who came to see me in my office. He was almost frantic as he walked in. I tell you, Mr. Gross, I keep hearing a radio station in my head. I hear music and jokes and station announcements. Why, it's driving me nuts. You hear it now? Uh, no, not only uh, when I'm only at home. I, I, I don't hear it through our radio. I, I hear it when the radio was turned off through my own head. You know, Graham, I thought that man was crazy. But later, I got the entire story. It seems that this man worked in a carborundum factory, and the filings of the carborundum had become embedded between his teeth. Hmm. Now, living near the transmitter of a large radio station, he was actually receiving that station's programs through the filings in his teeth. <laughs> you see, Graham, he had become an animated <laughs> receiving set. That is, that is, Aunt Ben, very. Uh, how about some more oddities? Got any more? I certainly have, Graham. Well, I remember one instance some years ago when Rudy Valley was at the height of his amazing popularity and he was almost worshipped by his listeners. One time, I happened to print in my column a remark saying that perhaps, after all, Toscanini knew just a little more about music than Rudy Valley. And you should have heard the phone calls I got. Say, how do you come print that stuff about Valley? Rudy knows more in his little finger about music than anybody else in the business. Hey, Mr. Gross, what do you mean writing that about Rudy? If I ever meet you on the street, I'll scratch your eyes out. <laughs> and now, Graham, come back with me to the early 1920s. Were they glad to get radio acts in those days? Why, you just walk into a studio, pay a friendly visit to some announcer, and he might come up to you and say... Say, listen, Smith wants to go on the air tonight to sing, but they just sent word someone asked him to a party. He isn't going to show up. Can you sing, play the piano, or tell jokes? If you can, we'll put you on right away. And, Graham, I finally remember when all the stations on a network had to be a mentioned by the announcer at the finish of a program, don't you? <laughs> That's right, Ben. Before the day of the local station breaks for identification, we announced all stations on the chain from New York. Phil Carlin and I used to vie with each other uh, for a couple of years uh, just to try to show which one could uh, rattle off the most call letters in one breath. Uh, the sign-off sounded something like this. This program has come to you through stations W-E-A-F, W-R-C, W-T-A-G, W-G-R, W-W-O, W-C-A-P, W-A-C, W-T-A-M, W-O-C, W-E-E-I, W-J-R, W-J, K-S-D, W-C-C-O, W-D-A-F, W-G-A-N, W-C-S-A, W-I-C, W-L-I-T, W-S-A-I. Want any more, Ben? Want any more? No, no, that's enough. Well, Graham, those were the days, weren't they? Yes, they were, Ben, no doubt of that. Thank you very much, Ben Gross. Behind the mic salutes a program you love. We in radio believe that radio has a tradition of which it can well be proud. A tradition of good programs that linger fondly in our memory. And so each week, we bring you a star or a part of a program you used to hear, a program you love. This afternoon, Behind the Mic salutes Real Folks, written by and starring George Frame Brown. Real Folks was one of the most popular programs on the air between 1926 and 1932. Remember? Each week, millions of people throughout the country awaited the next episode in the lives of Matt Tompkins, who was the mayor of Tompkins Corners, as well as the owner of its general store, his wife, Marthy, and their friends, Real Folks. And now, an episode of Real Folks with the original cast of George Frame Brown, Elsie May Gordon, Irene Hubbard, and Ed Whitney. There's the evening train whistling for Hunter's Bottom. That's Tompkins' store over there. I see the lights on in the kitchen. Mr. Tompkins seemed to be making apple butter, and Elmer, he's the boy they adopted, is earning his allowance by wiping the supper dishes. Matt's up in the store all alone. It looks like he's trying to pry up a floorboard. 
so beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. Ouch! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Cracky! Oh, what, uh, what's the matter, Mayor Tompkins? Well, Sneed, I didn't see you. I hit my finger. Where'd you come from? Oh, uh, I come in the side door. Uh, what you tearing up the floor for, huh? Oh, just cause. Uh, why don't you go out and find Elmer? Run out and play. Oh, uh, Elmer can't play till he, uh, till he gets the dishes wiped. Oh. I'll, I'll go out and see you. Oh, hello, Marthy. Uh, what on earth are you doing, Matt? Uh, I'm doing something, Marthy. Matt, you see the article in the paper about putting your name up for the state assemblyman? Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear you say nothing about it. Ain't you pleased? Are you, Marthy? I want anything you want, Matt. Oh, why don't you rest? You look worn out. You worried about Sneed Yeager's family? No, I can straighten them out in a day when I have a mind to. Well, there's only one thing that could get you in a state like this. Now tell me the truth. Is it politics? Marthy, if I was sent to prison... <gasps> prison? Yeah. What on earth could you be sent to prison for? Stealing. Stealing? Yeah. Why, you never stole nothing in your life. Well, of course I never, but if some folks thought maybe I'd get somewhere politically, they could make me look out like a thief and put me out of the running early. Martha, do you remember Miss Jones coming in here about two weeks ago? Two weeks ago? Don't you remember the day she come in here with a little package she wanted me to keep in the safe? Yes. Well, she had some jewelry in that package. There was a small string of pearls with a diamond fastening. Mm hmm. She's got a big diamond sunburst. Yeah, that's what's caused the trouble, that sunburst. Miss Jones got nervous about having that jewelry up at her sunny Crassville there. She asked me to keep it here in the safe. Oh, Matt! Yeah, I took them, and I insisted on giving her a signed piece of paper showing I'd received them. That big diamond sunburst is missing. Missing? Yeah. Well, when did you discover it was gone? Thursday a week. Oh, why didn't you mention it before? Well, I didn't want to give up hunting. I kept thinking maybe it was my fault for not putting the things in the safe like she asked me. Oh, why didn't you? Oh, the old safe's a light. Anybody could break into it. Oh, where'd you hide them? I've been wearing the pearls around my neck under my undershirt. What? Yeah. Well, what'd you do with the pin? Uh, the first night I had them jewels here, I hid the diamond pin down in the flaxseed. Oh, well, where else did you have it? One night I had it in the navy beans, and then the next night I took the sunburst out of the beans, and I pinned it way up under a banana on the stalk. Uh, what night was that? Uh, it was Friday, wasn't it? Well, yes. You hollered in your sleep that uh, night. Saturday morning, there's... It was safe and sound, pinned in the banana. I took it off in the ward all day. Then Saturday night, I hid it under the rat poison. And Sunday evening, before we went to service, I took a look. It was gone. Oh, dear. Well, why don't you talk it over with Judge Whipple or some of your good friends? The judge generally drops in for a few minutes talking Oh, to not me. yet. I'll hunt for a day or two more. Yes, now I'm going to do some hunting myself. Well, all right. Uh, Hi, Matt. Oh, there's the judge now. Just pretend like nothing's wrong. I'll be right back. Yeah, all right. Oh, good evening, Judge. Oh, good evening, Matt. Uh, Matt, did you hear anything about the Yeager family? Uh, what do you mean, Judge Whipple? Well, I hear they're having enough to eat down there. Oh, well, uh, land sakes. Need Yeager plays around here every day. He seems chipper. Uh, he was around here tonight. Uh, well, that's good. I hate to intrude. Bonjour, everybody. Oh, good evening, Miss Jones. Mayor <laughs> Tompkins, I had the funniest dream about you last night. I dreamt I was being shown through a penitentiary. Oh, and... uh, good evening, Miss Jones. Oh, good evening. Uh, Mayor Tompkins, I merely dropped in to collect those things I left for safekeeping. Uh, Matt, I'll tell her. Just a minute, uh my duty, I'll tell her. Miss Jones, I'm aware in your pearls here around my neck, but your big diamond sunburst pin, it's gone. But maybe we'll... Oh, Mary Tompkins, surely you're joking. Oh, I only wish he was joking, Mrs. Oh, Jones. Oh, that sunburst, it was such a unique piece. He gave it me when my oldest son was born. I... Well, Mrs. Jones, we'll make good for it if we have to lose the store. That is this the truth. Yeah, it is, Judge. What's worse, looks like a put-up job to me. Uh... Why, Matt, if this comes out in the papers, it'll mean goodbye to your political career. Why, 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 why is that? Why, 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 I figured he stole it. I didn't know. Well, besides playing truant from school, is taken to steal it. I have not. I never stole nothing in my now, life. wait a minute here, please. Sneed, did you steal this pin? Why, I, I, uh, I didn't intend to, uh, Mayor Tompkins. No, sir. Now, you answer me honestly. How did it come in your possession? Well, I, 
I was passing a store one day last week, and no one was here, and I sneaked in and swiped a banana. Well, the bin was stuck to the banana, so I just kept it. I thought it was some kind of a prize or something, like you find in candy, and I've been playing with it. I've... Well, Sneed, after all the years we've been such good friends, why would you want to swipe one of my bananas? Why didn't you ask me for one? Gosh, Mayor Tompkins, my pa ain't got a job, and ma has to work away from home. Pa's always so worried and cross. Well, all the other kids at school have got a banana or orange or something for lunch. When I took that banana, I was hungry. Gosh, I, I wish I was dead. <laughs> oh, selfish and miserable, I feel. I worried about the diamond ornaments when there are hungry children in the world who wish they were dead. I... Sneed Yeager, you've taught me a great lesson. From now on, I'm going to be perfectly charming to that dreadful pest from the Income Tax Bureau. Sneed, don't you want to ride home with me in my car? Gosh, could I, Miss Jones? Certainly. Hey, are you riding in the station wagon or your uh, mausoleum? The huh? station wagon. Come along, Sneed. Good night, <laughs> Mary Nicholas. <laughs> uh, wait a second, Mrs. Jones. I'm going. Oh, yes, Judge Whipple. I'll give you a lift. Uh, good night, Mayor Tompkins. Uh, good night, Miss Tompkins. Good night. Good night. <laughs> well, they're gone. Here. Yeah. It's like having a prayer answered, finding that sunburst. Martha, are you very tired? <laughs> I guess I'm not as tired as you are. Why? Would you go over there to the groceries and pick out a lot of good staple things while I lock up? I'm going to take them down there to Sneed Yeager's house first thing in the morning. Of course I will, Matt. Oh, Matt, yeah? there's a whip I will. Yeah, I heard it. My, don't it sound pretty? It certainly does, Martha. I guess there's a lot of folks way high up in politics tonight that wishes they was back living beside the country road listening to a whippoorwill. Thank you, George Frame Brown, Elsie Mae Gordon, Irene Hubbard, and Ed Whitney. And here's a little behind the mic touch. The part of Mrs. Jones was played by George Frame Brown, who also played Matt Tompkins. And the part of the boy, Sneed Yeager, was played by Elsie Mae Gordon. <laughs> behind the scenes of the broadcasting business in minor capacities are men and women some of them with unusual talents. For instance, those of you who visit the studio on the eighth floor of the NBC building have often met our next guest without suspecting just how unusual he really is. He's in charge of the pages on that floor, but he does a good deal more than that in his own right. His name is Addy Amor, and we're going to have him tell you all about it. Addy Amor. Hello, Addy. Hello. Addy, besides working as a page at NBC, what do you do on your own time? Uh, well, Mr. McNamee... Oh, cut that Mr. McNamee stuff. You're a celebrity now, Addy. Come on. Well, Graham, I'm the master of ceremonies of three programs on a small New York station. Programs which I originated. What are they? One is a program called The Coffee Club. A second is called Back and Forth, and it consists of household hints. I do that program with a woman collaborator, and the other program is called The Swing High Club. It's a program for jitterbugs. Oh, I know all about jitterbugs. A jitterbug's a fellow who's all rhythm and no neighbors. Well, I'm a bit of a jitterbug myself. When I was at the Villanova College, I played cornet in my own band. Oh, you did? Well, how, how, how'd you happen to uh, come in and be an NBC as a page boy? Well, I'll tell you, uh, Graham. Then later on, I had my own band in Boston, and we played at the Westminster Hotel following Mal Hallett. Uh -huh. And then about that question about my coming to NBC? Yeah. It was love, Graham. Love? You mean Cupid hit you with a microphone? I had a girl in New York, and I was so unhappy being away from her that I gave up my job in Boston and came to New York and got married. But why didn't you stay in the band business? Because my wife wanted to lead a normal social life and not hang around until 3 in the morning waiting for me. So I got a job at NBC as a page, figuring that I could make contacts with radio celebrities and that it might be a good way for me to break into the business. Someday, I might get a job as master of ceremonies on some big program. But don't you do more things musically than play the cornet? You mean uh, the songs I've written, Graham? That's it. I've written four songs which have been published. 
The latest of them is called The Sky Without the Stars. It was published recently by Broadcast Music Incorporated, and it's been played a few times on the networks. Rudy Valley told me that he was going to play it soon on his program. Good. Imagine, folks, and he's just one of the boys who shows you into the studio. And now, ladies and gentlemen, one of radio's popular songstresses, and I mean that, the lovely-voiced Mary Small will sing Addie Amor's The Sky Without the Stars. <laughs> I'm just like the sky without the stars, dear, when I'm away from you. What good is the sky without the stars, dear, what good am I? Without you There's an empty space Where my heart should be No smile to cheer me Just an empty space When I look to see If you are near me I'm just like the sky Without the stars when I'm away from you. Thank you, Mary Small. Thank you for your lovely singing, as always. And thank you, Adia Moore. I like your tune. I think you've got a great future. the National Association of Broadcasters, an organization representing most of the broadcasting stations throughout the country, sponsored an essay contest in the Connecticut high schools. This contest and the $100 prize offered for the best essay on the subject of the American system of broadcasting. Why it is best for Americans was won by a 14-year-old boy, Neil Axtell Blake of Hartford Public High School. Because we think his essay is not only interesting, but a timely slant on radio, Behind the Mic has invited Neil to read an excerpt from it. Neil Axtell Blake. Neil, will you please go right ahead and read a little of that essay of yours? Thank you, Mr. McNamee. Often I think that the radio has become so thoroughly a part of us that we fail to realize how much we owe to its mysterious power. It enters our homes at will, past locked doors and barred windows. Its power to send information, entertainment, instruction, scientific achievement, the truth into 84% of the homes in this country has made every citizen more sensitive to the dangers that threaten, more determined to keep America what our forefathers made it, the land of the free. How different the scene abroad, where the government restricts and hampers. There the dictator argues, am I not the supreme wisdom? Should not my people learn from me? The account is no longer a sports of happy homes of freedom, but of hate, destruction, and death. I'm devoutly thankful that I live in America, for here the radio, with all its power for good or evil, is the instrument of democracy. Long may the American system last. American broadcasting policy helps to keep this continent the promised land. That's swell, Neil. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Neil Axel Blake. I've been in radio a long time, longer than I like to remember sometimes. And I've heard a lot of unusual stories about radio. But I don't think I ever heard a story as fantastic as the behind-the-mic story that will be told us by our next guest. And yet he assures me that every amazing detail of it is absolutely true. Our guest is Dave Ellman, whose new program, Contact, is fast-growing in popularity. The story concerns an appearance on another delightful program of his, Hobby Lobby a show which dealt with people's unusual hobbies. And here is the creator of that show, Dave Ellman. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Exactly what was that fantastic story behind that appearance on your Hobby Lobby show? Well, Graham, when I had been on the air with Hobby Lobby for just a week, 
A friend of mine called me on the telephone and gave me the telephone number of a woman who had a talking dog. Did you say a talking dog? Yes. So as soon as he hung up, I phoned the owner of the dog, and I said to her, Hello? This is Dave Elman in New York. I've got a new radio program called Hobby Lobby. Yes, Mr. Elman? I was told that you have a talking dog. Uh, is that yes. so? Yes, that's true. Well, it seems hard to believe. Would you mind putting the dog on the phone? I'd like to hear him talk. Just a minute. I'll call him to the phone and have him speak to you. Here, Prince. Here, Prince. Speak. Hello. Hello. What? <laughs> yes. That's the dog. <laughs> is that really a dog that talks? It is. I'll have him say a few more words. Prince, say I love you. I love you. <laughs> say, I want you to come to New York and appear on my program next week. I think that's the most amazing thing I ever heard. Well, Graham, the mistress, and her two dogs arrived in New York. Two dogs? Yes, because she brought another dog along named Lady. She told me that Lady was Prince's closest companion, and that Prince might not perform unless Lady was along. Well, I called up the newspaper, and they sent reporters to my office to hear the dog. Oh, the dog really was wonderful. He talked beautifully. Now, Prince, come on. Say Aunt Nora. Come on. Say Aunt Nora. Prince. Aunt Nora. Aunt Nora. Aunt Nora. Oh, that's wonderful. wonderful. Gee, that was swell. Hey, See, can I take really a picture? Does talk. Hey, can he talk enough for an interview? Yeah, can he talk? <laughs> well, Prince was really in great form that day, but more and more reporters came into my office, and as they did, of course, the office naturally got hotter. Well, Prince suddenly stopped talking. His mistress explained that dogs perspire through their throats, and when the temperature of a room gets over 70 degrees, the perspiration in the dog's throat made it impossible for him to talk. Well, to cool the dog off, we tried ice water. Then someone suggested ice cream. We tried three different flavors. The only flavor he would eat at all was chocolate, and then he talked again. Well, as I said before, this was one of my first programs, and it was very important to me that everything go off successfully. Then with the other dog, Lady, trailing along, we brought Prince over to rehearsal before the show and put him on a table before the microphone. Come on now. Talk, Princey. Come on. Nice, Princey. C come on, Princey. Talk. Say, uh, uh, are you sure that ladies being here isn't disturbing him? Oh, no. Prince, he likes lady. Quiet, quiet, lady. Quiet, quiet. Well, maybe he doesn't like the shape of this microphone. Let's use this other mic over here. Maybe he'll like that. Come on over here, Prince. Come on, now. Come on, talk. Come on, Prince, talk. Speak. Speak. Come on, speak. Well, I couldn't get that dog to talk at all, Graham, at the preliminary rehearsal. And then to make things more difficult, his mistress told me that we couldn't put him in front of an, of an audience because he never worked before an audience before and would be scared. So at the last minute, we took Prince and his companion lady into a small studio which we had air-conditioned so it would be under 70 degrees. It was so air-conditioned, I almost froze. Well, the time came for us to go on the air. That dog just had to talk or it would ruin my show. Finally, we got to Prince's spot and I introduced him something like this. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you will hear this Daniel Webster of the doghouse, Prince. Well, he's having a little difficulty. Maybe he doesn't want to talk until he sees his Come lawyer. Come on, Princey, Princey, say I love you. Princey, say I love you, say I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, we seem to be having a little difficulty getting Princey to gab just now, but keep listening and you'll hear him. Well, that room was ice cold, Graham, but I never sweated so much in my life. I could see the crumbling ruins of a perfectly good show, and then suddenly, to my amazement, his mistress turned to the other dog, who was also in the studio, and said... All right, Princey, since you won't talk, Lady will. Come on, Lady, now you talk. Say, say hello, Aunt Nora. Come on, Lady. Hello. Hello, Aunt Nora. And so, Graham, the stooge, who we never knew could talk, stood in for the star and spoke his lines instead. So just as we promised, we did have a talking dog on Hobby Lobby, even if it wasn't the one which was originally scheduled. <laughs> well, thank you, Dave Elman. That was a mighty good story. Thank you and hot, I, I mean, the cold dog. What a story. <laughs> Be sure to listen next week when Behind the Mic will bring back to you a few minutes of a favorite old program. Harry Horlick and the A&P Gypsies with Harry Horlick himself conducting. And more of the human interest, the glamour, the comedy, the drama that are found behind the mic. This is Graham McNamee speaking. Good afternoon, all. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>